Hey church, welcome back. I'm so excited to be speaking to you today from Acts chapter 8. Thank you for joining us for worship. Thank you for hanging out through the videos. Acts chapter 8, if you have a Bible, Acts chapter 8. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. I'm really excited to share this message it's called Scattered But Not Stopped. It's a, a message that God put on my heart and I'm really excited to share with you today. So if you have a Bible, Acts chapter 8. Verses 1 through 4. And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so gracious. You are kind. You are loving. You are holy. You are in control. You are greater than anything in this world. Lord, I pray that you would calm anxious minds, bring peace into fearful hearts, bring love and joy and hope into anxiety. Lord, I pray that you would remind us today that while we are scattered, we are not stopped. You have not stopped. We may be physically distant, but Lord, you are never socially distant. You are with us in this moment. Wherever we are, we can meet you, and we are thankful for that. Lord, and, and speaking, Lord, of not being stopped, thank you for not stopping those who distribute coffee, because you know how much we need coffee in this time, and that is a great gift from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever uh, have you ever felt scattered before? Ever felt like you just didn't maybe have it all together? You might feel that way right now. With all that's going on, there's new announcements every day from multiple different people. There's social media rumors. There's there's all these different things floating around. There is sickness. There is um, isolation, and it's it's hard to not feel scattered in these moments. Especially because no one who we know has gone through something like this before. I've been in contact with as many churches as I can possibly get in contact with. House churches, mega churches, denominational heads, churches from all across America. We had churches from California this week calling us, hey, what are you guys experiencing? And we've been in contact with churches everywhere of all shapes, all sizes, and all models. And the one thing we learned is that we're all experiencing this for the very first time together. None of us have gone through what we are going through before. My grandma went through this. My grandma was born in 1915 in Pickerington, Ohio. The Spanish flu happened in 1918. There was a world war, a Great Depression. She survived a global pandemic, a Great Depression, and two world wars. She lived to be 100 years old before she passed away. But unless you are that age, you've never experienced anything like that before. But interestingly enough, there was a church that went through something like this. We read about them in Acts chapter 8. If you don't know the history of this church, this is called the Church of Jerusalem. I'm going to give you the timeline. Now, listen. Bear with me, all right? I know I just said I'm going to tell you some history. Don't flip over to Netflix right now. Don't jump on something else. Just hang with me for a couple minutes. I think the history of this church applies to our churches today, maybe more than we've ever realized. Here's the history of the Church of Jerusalem. Jesus is born. We celebrate that at Christmas, right? He's born. He begins this ministry. In his ministry, he calls disciples. We would call them followers. He starts off with two fishermen, and his followers begin to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. He completes the mission God sent for him to do. He then lays down his life for us. Then he is raised from the dead. We uh, celebrate that at Easter. He then comes and meets with multitudes of his followers and then ascends into heaven and the church of Jerusalem goes back into Jerusalem and they begin to wait and they begin to pray and they begin to study and they begin to see what is next. Then God sends the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, in Acts chapter 2, something we call 
the day of Pentecost. I want to read for you Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the proceeds to all as had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. From this point on, the church of Jerusalem begins to just explode in growth. They begin to explode financially. They begin to explode in favor with man. And they begin to take off. But we get to Acts chapter 8 and something new begins to happen to the church. A man named Saul decides to take on himself the mission of stopping the church. He decides it will be his personal goal in life to stop the church. So he kills one of their leaders named Stephen, along with some other religious leaders, and then they begin to hunt down and kill people who are believers in the church of Jerusalem. The believers, the church, begins to be scattered. They begin to go everywhere. But God showed me this this week in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, and I read it and I skipped over and God said to me, read it again. So I read it again, and I want to read it again to you. Acts 8, 4. Now those who were scattered about preached, went, went about preaching the word. I said, okay, God, thank you. Let me read. He's like, no, read it again. So I read it again. God's like, read it again. So I read it again. And then God was like, think about what you're saying. And that was when God said this to me. They were scattered, but they were not stopped. They were scattered, but they were not stopped stopped. In fact, the book of Acts goes on and it dedicates this entire book to the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Church of Jerusalem and it goes on and it begins to describe how they begin to change the world with the gospel. In fact, they get more churches in more places that begin to pop up and they begin to grow and interestingly enough, one of the main leaders of this church one of the main people responsible for the growth of this church is Saul. Yes, Saul, the one who said, I'm going to shut the church down. I'm going to stop the church. God saves him and he becomes one of the leaders of this church. Why? Because God can turn obstacles into opportunities. God can turn obstacles into opportunities. God took what was meant to be an obstacle to the church and turned it into its greatest opportunity. And today, you and I face obstacles. We face a virus that we've never experienced before. We face economic downfall. We face a shutdown. We face job losses. We face many of these things, sickness. We face isolation. We face separation. We face being scattered and quarantined, but we are not stopped. And we will not be stopped. Paul said, who Saul becomes Paul, later on he writes to a church called the Church of Philippi, and he says to them, I can do all things through Christ. And God wants me to say to you, whether you're on Instagram, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on YouTube, whatever it is, God wants me to say to you, you can do all things through Christ. Come on, church. If you are watching this, I can't get you to clap. I can't get you to say amen. But I can get you to hit the hearts and the like button on there, okay? No human being can stop the church. Because the church does not belong to a human being. The church is not a building. It is not a denomination. There is no virus that can stop the church. There is no shutdown that can stop the church. The church is the body of Christ. It belongs to him. You are the church. You belong to him. I am the church. I belong to him. We are the church and we belong to him. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You know what that means? 
Greater is he that is in you than any virus that's in the world. Greater is he that is in you than anything in the world. There is nothing in this world that can stop the church. If you are a believer today, he is in you. If he is in you, he is for you. And if he is for you, the Bible says that the very gates of hell itself cannot stop the church. We have the same power in us that the early church had. In fact, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead turns losses into victories, mourning into dancing, obstacles into opportunities, shame into glory, bones into armies, seas into highways, and graves into garden lives in us. Come on now, hit that like button. Let us know. Give us a thumbs up. Let us know that I'm speaking to you because, man, this hit me hard this week. We might be scattered, but we are not stopped. In fact, we are going to do more than ever before. And here's why I firmly believe that. Because hope is contagious. Hope is contagious. When we as a church have hope in a hopeless world, we as a church spread like wildfire. Love in a selfish world is contagious. Joy in a mourning, sad world is contagious. Peace in an anxious, scared world is contagious. And the gospel is contagious. You're asking right now, okay, that's cool, that's cool. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That verse, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is contagious. The early church took those things into one-on-one -on -one conversations, house meetings, prayers, communion, and community. And we will take those things with us wherever we go. If it's in your living room on Instagram, if it's on YouTube, it's on Facebook, we will take hope, love, joy, peace, and the gospel with us because that same power lives in us. We are committed to being a church more than ever before. Do you feel alone? We're here for you. Are you scared? We're here for you. Do you need fear? Do you have fear? We are here for you. Do you need food? We are here for you. The church is here and we are not going anywhere. Why? Because Jesus didn't go anywhere and he isn't going anywhere either. There is no virus in the history of mankind that can make God socially distant from us. I want to challenge you right now. Social distancing does not exist for God and it does not exist for the church. Social distancing does not exist for God or the church. Hear me out because I don't want to be on Twitter later on getting bashed for saying something like this. So hear me out. We are very careful as a church to follow and respect and follow the guidelines of our government. We're very careful to do that. In fact, we were one of the very first churches in Columbus to say, you know what, we're going to online services. We are going to scatter, but we're not going to be stopped. Here's why. We may be physically separate, but socially, emotionally, and spiritually, we are closer than we've ever been before. Just because we are physically separate does not mean we are socially separate. Just because we are physically distant does not mean we are socially distant or emotionally distant or spiritually distant. We are socially, emotionally, and spiritually closer than we have ever been before. You matter to us. In fact, that was one of the reasons that we decided to go to online services only. Our core values are you matter. And truthfully, you matter more to me than just a place in a seat sitting down so I can feel confident talking in front of people. You matter. Your health matters. We care for you and you matter to us. But God is not socially removed from us just because we are scattered. And we will not be socially removed from each other just because we are scattered. We will follow the rules of our leadership and our government. But we will be socially, emotionally, and spiritually closer than ever before. God meets us wherever we are. Think about this. 
God met Adam and Eve in a garden. He met Noah in a boat. He met Jacob in a wrestling match. He met Abraham on a mountain. Moses in a desert. Joshua in a battlefield. David in a field. Solomon in a temple. Elijah in a cave. Peter in a storm. His son on a hill. Mary in a garden. And Saul on a road. And he will meet you wherever you are. Wherever you are right now, he will meet you. You don't have to come to a building to meet with God. He will meet you where you are. He wants to meet with you. Now, if you're listening and you, you've never met him before, I think there's probably one of two people listening who have not met him yet. You might be a, somebody who knows about him. Like me, maybe you were raised in church and someone put up pictures of a, a blonde-haired, uh, blue-eyed guy with a white sheet and like a Miss America sash going across him. And he was handing out food to other bunch of other European people looking people. And maybe you know about him, but you don't know him. Maybe you know who he is, but that's it. But you've never come to the point in your life where you had and developed and accepted him as your Lord and Savior and developed a personal relationship with him. I want to encourage you to do that right now. You may be the other group of people who have not met him and you don't really know much about him. All you know about him is Christians. You know that they're usually hypocrites and that they usually end up doing the same things that you do. They just cover it up better. And you don't know much about him. You can meet him as well. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the one who is always with you. He is the one who cares for you like no other. And he wants to meet you where you are. You are never, ever socially distant from him. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he is with you forever. He will never leave you or forsake you. And I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. There's no set amount of words where you can accept Jesus Christ. But there is this idea of a prayer. I prayed this prayer in 2001 after September 11th. I was beginning to just feel anxious and I was beginning to thank God, do you really care about me? And I prayed with someone who walked me through this and I prayed a prayer and I simply said, God, I, I believe in Jesus. I want Jesus in my life and I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. I want to accept him as my Lord and Savior and I want to follow him for the rest of my life and into eternity. And in that moment, I experienced him in a brand new, fresh way. If you're here today and you would like to meet Jesus for the first time, you might be anxious and scared and nervous and all this has got you thinking about heaven, it's got you thinking about hell, it's got you thinking about eternity, it's got you thinking about life and the afterlife and all those things, I want to pray with you right now. So if you'll pray with me and you'll say something along these lines, Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart and save me. I choose to follow Jesus. If you prayed that prayer right now, we would love to know that. We would like for you to either let us know on here or you can email us at churchinthewild2 at gmail.com. But we want to know so we can get some stuff to you so we can help you develop and grow this relationship with this great God who is never socially distant. If you are here today and, and like me, you might be a little bit anxious. You're a follower of Jesus Christ, but you might be thinking, how's my business going to stay afloat? How is this going to keep happening? How is my family's health going to last? How are we doing? How are we doing with this? And anxiety begins to creep in. You're a follower of Jesus, but you're nervous. And you're worried about social distancing. You're worried about him not being with you. Let me encourage you and challenge you to continue to trust in him, to continue to let hope flow and abound in your heart, joy abound in your heart, peace abound in your heart, and continue to keep your eyes on him. He will never leave you or forsake you. He is with you right now, even in your living room, even on your phone, even on your television, your iPad, your laptop, wherever it is that you're watching this, he is with you. And he is for you. And yes, we may be scattered, but we will never be stopped. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The church of Jerusalem was scattered, but they were not stopped. We might be scattered, but we are not stopped. You might feel scattered, but you will not be stopped. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I just ask that wherever you are, 
wherever people are, wherever they're watching this, wherever they're encountering this, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself in a new and a fresh way. I pray, Lord, that you would give Christians courage in these times. Lord, I pray that you would begin to allow hope and joy and peace and love and especially the gospel to become contagious through us, that you would begin to flow through us, that you would begin to shine through us, that we would be the light in a dark night. Lord, I pray for anyone who's here who's never accepted you before as their Lord and Savior. Give them, please, the courage to do so now. We will honor and we will glorify and uplift you through all of these things. In Jesus' name.